What is the role of religion in our ever-changing world? From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Issues of Faith. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Issues of Faith. We are talking today about the story of idealism maturing. When you have grand expectations, want to save the world, what are some of the problems that you encounter? Happy to have with us Jenna Lee Nardella, founder of Blood Water Mission, and also author of a new book. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. The new book, 1,000 Wells, here it is. How an audacious goal taught me to love the world instead of save it. So at a very young age, you had a big calling. Mm. What was the calling and, and how, how did it happen? Well, the dream was to be able to provide clean water for communities in Africa. I had learned about these people who had to walk miles every day to get water and water that wasn't even clean and that there could be something I could do to make a difference. And so the dream was 1,000 wells, 1,000 communities in Africa with clean water. And I was 21 years old at the time. So you're 21 years old and you have this this dream. Mm -hmm. What called you to Africa? How did, how did that come about? So I came across Jars of Clay, the Christian rock band that's here in Nashville, and they were the ones who were really passionate about Africa. And I had heard their vision of blood water and wanting to make a difference there, and so I became passionate myself. And drilling wells, why, why the, the name blood water? Where, where did that come from? Yeah, it came out of the two particular needs that the band had seen in Africa. The need for clean water, um, but also the need for clean blood that's more symbolic about the HIV AIDS crisis. So blood free from HIV. And so AIDS and water were the two issues that they really wanted to address in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's also an imagery of Jesus hanging from the cross. And um, when the spear pe pierced his side, the blood and water that flowed was a symbol of life-giving sacrifice. and Today, in the same sense, they still need, in the physical elements, blood and water. So when I said at the top, we're talking about idealism maturing. Here you are, 21 years old, and you have this goal, I'm going to build a thousand wells or help get that done. Yeah. And in the movies, that works out perfectly. So <laughs> here's a 21-year-old, they go out, and it just happens. This book is about what you encountered along the way. Right. And so how... I like the title. It taught me to love the world instead of save it. What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, I grew up in the millennial age of the, the world is your oyster. You can do anything. Just if you put your mind to it, it will happen. And also this sense of um, instant gratification. And so I wanted to get a thousand wells in Africa and be able to save the world and thought really that I could do it if I just worked hard enough and got enough people and enough money. And, um, and the real story is just realizing how difficult it is to do a good thing in the world. And, and what do you do when your idealism falls to your feet? What do you do when you do all these hard efforts in Africa and you build rain tanks with communities in, in the desert but the rain never comes? And, um, and having to wrestle with issues of faith and belief about what you're capable of doing in the world when you come to grips with how hard it is to do a good thing in the world. At some point you write, I don't believe in as much as I used to, but what I do believe in, I believe in more. That's right. And so when you say you don't believe in as much as you used to, what what do you mean there? I think I used to believe that everyone had the best of intentions and that if you poured enough passion into something you could see the results you wish for. I think I believed that I would see the end of global poverty in my lifetime or that I could be a significant part in changing that. And um, and I think what I what I believe in more now is about what you can do for in the small and in the proximity of your own life and world but being able to have a right-sized idea of what it means to make a difference. Because you encountered corruption. Mm -hmm. So here you are again, you're raising all this money, you're doing these great things, and then you see, well, not everyone's on the same page here. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is really trying to save people over there, right? And, yeah. and so how... I guess, how disheartening is that? It's heartbreaking, and um, I fought against the idea of corruption because I believed in the good of everyone, and, and I think what was really 
shocking was it's not just the corruption that I came across in Africa, but it was also my own limitations and our uh, the systems that are so difficult to be able to work against. Like if you look at uh, at the issue of, of a lack of clean water, it's not just that you can bring water and it's better. There are all these other layers that make it so much more complicated and it's because human beings are involved. And um, and so that's the challenge and um, it, made it, it made it very difficult to want to be able to believe that I could do anything anymore because I thought if I loved Africa, Africa would love me back. And how does that this kind of evolution and this kind of deeper understanding of our broken world, mm -hmm. how does that impact your faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, um, my priest, Becca, talks a lot about choosing to love the world instead of saving it. And that's where I think she gave me the language that really helped me understand that it's not, the world isn't ours to save, but, um, but it is ours to love. And we can do that because we have been given so much love in our own lives that we can offer that to others. And you talk about uh, your worldview. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, I've asked this question before. I mean, you go to Africa and, and you see people over there that are dying because they can't afford a mosquito net. Yeah. You write that. Yeah. You know, mothers lose babies because they can't afford a mosquito net. Mm -hmm. A billion people in the world live on a dollar a day or less. Right. And then you, you come here and it's so different. Mm -hmm. And again, as a young person, that's a, that's a rude, harsh awakening. Yeah. And I, I guess, how does that, because there's some who say, how can God let that happen? Right. And so their faith is harmed. It, it, that question, they can't get past it. Yeah. And so when someone asks you that question, or when you dealt with it, what do you say? I had so much anger and I had so much cynicism when I had to um, go back and forth from a world of plenty and a world of want or scarcity. And I had to really shift the way I understood the world as it is, and it's not just either or. And I think what I came to realize was that in the places in Africa where it looks so poor, they had an abundance of things that we just don't have here in the U.S. They have community. They have resilience. They have a faith that I could never have on my own because they know that when the rain comes, it is from God. They know that when the crops grow, it is from God. And we think that we are the ones who make these things happen or that we've earned it or deserved it. And so oftentimes I've learned that as I've come back to the U.S., I feel more pity for us and for the, the poverty that we have more in our souls than we do in maybe in the, the luxuries um, that we live in. So it did not harm your faith. I mean, it didn't it did make you angry, but you were still able to come away with a sense of, of God is in control. It, yeah. It's a different sort of thing, though. Yeah, it's not a clean and pretty faith. It's one that is is wrecked um, by the mystery and the brokenness. And, um, and I can't keep it in a box, and it's not something, especially if you come to know the world and all its doubt and darkness, and you have to try to love it still. It is so hard. And so it's maybe it's a faith with a whimper more than a shouting from the mountaintops. And I think that there is something that I've learned about God in knowing not just Americans, but also villagers in Africa and understanding God's character um, through knowing everyone. And I, I think I learned that maybe it's not it's not because an ocean is separating us that we ought to be apart, but that there are ways to bridge and that we get to experience um, a, a beautiful kingdom here on earth when we are in community with one another and we learn from each other. And there are things that we can bring to Africa that are a total gift to people. And there are things that Africans can really bring to us that are also a tremendous gift. And so I think there's something beautiful that, that we're invited into as people of faith to know our brothers and sisters across an ocean. There's a, a chapter in here called No Promises mm. and and you talk about how you have to get up, you're, you're there in Africa, you have to speak in front of a group of people yeah. and you're warned about something. What 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 is that? What happens there? So there's been so many uh, Westerners, Americans who've come into uh, villages in Africa. They see poverty, they hear needs, and then they make these grand promises about what they're going to do when they go home. And they're going to come up with all this money or help build them clinics or whatever it is. But a lot of times those promises are empty. And they're well intended when they're there, but then they go home and then they forget or things get busy or things get more complicated. But the community is still there waiting for 
that promise to be fulfilled. So I was warned to never make promises and, um, and to surprise people if we actually are able to deliver on something that's deep on our hearts. Um, but the one promise that I did end up making in those communities is that I would tell their stories, that I would take the stories that they've shared with me and I would bring them back to my friends in the U.S. And that's a promise I've kept for over 11 years. Because I think it's natural for us to go over there, for Westerners or mission groups to go over there and, and see what is there and say, I'm going to change this. I mean, when you yeah. hear that mothers are losing babies because they can't afford a mosquito net, mm -hmm. you know, your initial thought is, well, I'm going to go buy a bunch of mosquito nets right. and everything's going to be just fine. Right. And, and sometimes we make those promises more for us mm -hmm. and, and that can be harmful to them. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Uh, there's a book out there called When Helping Hurts. And it's such a it's such an awful thing to realize that even the best of intentions can can actually cause harm. And so it's just making sure that that compassion is actually um, put in the right ways and in through the right channels and being able to understand that even though you want to respond immediately, even though I wanted to save the world by building all these wells or providing clinics or whatever it was, that there was a more slow and methodical and relationally driven approach to being able to do that and that it's not something that happens overnight but it happens over spans of lifetimes. So you're 21 years old and you decide you're going to do this. How long does it take and where are you now? How, 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 I mean, what, what happens? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was that I partnered with a band with Jars of Clay at 21, and we founded a nonprofit organization. We're based here in Nashville. We have 15 people on staff. We've provided water for more than a million people over the last 10 years. It's been amazing. We have HIV clinics in areas where most people have, um, have ignored. It's very, very marginalized, difficult places to be. And what we're in the business of is we raise money all around the U.S. by telling the stories that I promised I would tell. And then with that money, we partner with African organizations that are doing great work, small groups, there are nonprofits there, leaders that are already in their community doing great work, and we provide grants and capacity building and support to helping them do the work that they ought to be doing. So they get to be the heroes of their own story, and we get to come alongside and celebrate with them. All right, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and, and talk more about how this can impact all of us, how, how all of us can get involved, and what, it, what this story, how it can relate to, to all of us. So we'll take a break. Be back right after this.